Um, <coughs> so let's do some, do some math. Who's ready to do some math? Okay, so uh, my name is Zheng Yang. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Facebook Singapore. Uh, so this topic is uh, chaos theory in 20 minutes. Uh, I know math, math can be scary for a lot of people, but uh, trust me, today's math is very fundamental. You can understand it. Okay, so first question we ask, why chaos theory? Because it's very important. It is, uh, it can be found in many, this kind of behavior can be found in many natural systems. So uh, stuff like butterfly effects, three body problems, I believe you have heard of it. Anyone have heard of butterfly effects? Uh, quite a few people, yeah. Uh, for those who don't know about it, it's, uh, it's basically a metaphorical example where some butterfly uh, wings shaking can cause a tornado somewhere else. Uh, yeah. So a single small change in the initial uh, of the system can have very different outcomes, like drastic changes later on. Uh, besides that, uh, there's also um, it's also a very interesting topic in its own right. It's basically investigating some system that is deterministic, but at the same time unpredictable. Well, if you think about it, uh, determinism implies certainty, and certainty implies predict predictability. Uh, why there's some system that is deterministic, deterministic but not predictable. So I'll start with uh, some basic concepts, uh, namely functions and iterative functions. Uh, and then we'll look at two interesting uh, problems, or interesting systems, logistic map and the Conway's game of life. So uh, functions. Functions, you can, you can view it as a machine that transforms one number to another. Uh, in mathematical context, people would say it's an expression or it's an equation that uh, takes in a number and generates another number. So for example, two and the function called square, the output will be four. So if I put three inside, I'll get nine out. Uh, out. So pretty simple. And we, as developers, engineers, we write functions every day. In this case, input is the parameters, and output is the return value. Right, um, iterative function. So we know about functions, it's just mapping between input to output. Iterative functions just repeatedly like, applying the same function again and again. So taking example, initial value of x, taking the function x square, initial value of two, and in the first iteration, we plug in the initial value of two, and we get four out. And then the second iteration, iteration, we get four, we we'll plug in four, and then we get 16, and so on and so forth. So every iteration, you take the output of the previous iteration as the input, and then you get another output, which will in turn be the input of the next iteration. Simple, right? So we just repeat it the same thing. Um, here's some notation. So the four here, the superscript is not the exponentiation, it's just the fourth iteration of that function. And similarly, we do this kind of stuff every day. We, we write loops every day, and we write recursion, <coughs> hopefully, every day. Yeah. So it can be done in, in the computer programming context. Um, yeah, now we are equipped with functions and iterative functions, two very simple concepts. Um, now we look at one of the interesting uh, systems called logistic map. Logistic map is a family of functions taking this form. <laughs> okay, <K> on. <laughs> okay. I, I won't touch it again. <laughs> I wish there's no microphone here. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, logistic map is a function that takes this form r times x times one minus x. I think it's pretty easy to understand. And where r is a particular uh, number, you can just uh, plug in any values uh, to replace the r, <coughs> and you get a branch a branch of functions. Uh, they are called logistic maps. 
let's do some iterations on logistic map. Let's iterate logistic map. Um, on the right hand side, you have table where on the left column we have this uh, uh, iteration numbers. We start with 0 0.1, and in the first example, we take r equals to 2.5, and then if you're plugging uh, 0 0.1 into the x, and then you've got 2.6 times 0 0.1 times 1 minus 0 0.1, and you get to 0, 0.234. And then again, you take uh, input 0, 2, 3, 4, and you get another number. So uh, left-hand side is the iteration, and right-hand side is the value during that iteration, the output of the iteration. Um, so we plot the, this uh, table with horizontal axis being the, uh, the number of iterations and the vertical axis being the value. Uh, it's pretty much easy to understand. It's converging into a single value. So it settles on a single value means it's predictable. If you ask me, okay, what is the, uh, the value of 1,000 iteration? Probably you'll say it's just this, this value because it never changes after that. Uh, the reason being, if you put that number, plug in that number into this function, you get the same number out, so you're just stuck there. Okay, uh, not too interesting. Let's increase r to 3.4. And now you have a slightly more interesting pattern. Uh, it's oxidating between two values. It isn't set on a single value, but it's oxidating between two values. Um, if you ask me whether this is predictable, I would say yes, it's predictable. Uh, because if you ask me 1,000 integration, I'd probably say one of these two values. Right? So let's increase further uh, to 3.5. And now the pattern gets more interesting. Now it's oxidating among four different values. It settles on a M shape. So it just repeats like sine curve, it just uh, repeats itself. Still, I would say predictable. Okay, anyone can see a pattern here. Now we increase the R to three by eight. Anyone can see a pattern here? It turns out there's uh, no pattern. So it appears to be, if you run this for longer like iteration, number of iterations, you, 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 you'll never discover the a pattern. So it appears to be random, but if you think it carefully, uh, is it really random? Is it really random? No, it's not. It's not, right? Yeah, because you have the initial like value of 0 0.1, that's not random. And you have function, 3.8 times x times 1 minus x. That's also deterministic. And every step, you can just calculate it. There's nothing random, there's no random factor inside. But you ask me whether it's predictable. Do you think it's predictable? We did a Pardon? We did a It's not predictable, actually. Why? Uh, let's first look at the first reason. When we see the table here, what are we talking about? The table is generated by like everyone, like 20 iterations, like a loop of follow, I generate those numbers. But if you see, the numbers cannot be represented precisely a lot of time, oftentimes, in the computer. We use 32 bit, we use 64 bit to represent the floating point. But oftentimes, it's just an approximation. Think about 2 over 3. And precisely, it's, it's an infinite number of six digits. But usually you are just fine with like, rounding it to the seven as the last digit, right? So here I would say it's not the real value, real output of that function. It's approximation. So all this value you see is approximation. But it should be just be fine, right? Because approximations usually uh, is fine. We can work with approximation. Give us the, the, uh, a good way of understanding it. But it, it's not the case this way. This is what we call the behavior of chaotic systems. <coughs> it is the sensitivity to the initial conditions. We, we take two very close values, like 0 0.1 and 0 0.10001. Very tiny difference. And we run the same experiment. We use the same function, by the way. We run multiple iteration. And what do you observe? Initially, it matches our intuition, right? We can just use a, a similar number and 
the approximation should just work, so they overlap with each other. And after maybe 15, they start to slightly disagree with each other, after 15 iteration. And after 20 iteration, you see they go completely different ways. So we, everything stays the same. The only difference is that 0 0.0001, tiny difference. So if you run repeat this ex experiment with 32-bit uh, floating points, you get 0 0.5. 579, and if you repeat the same experiment with 64-bit, uh, you get 0 0.74. So this time, that tiny rounding error that you think is fine, but it is actually not fine. So it gives you different values. Which one do you think is correct? None of them is correct, right? Well, you may say that's just get the precise number, precise um, um, value. Uh, it turns out if you compute like the old school way, you just use like what you're doing on a pen of paper, and you just multiply digits by digits, um, it actually grows exponentially. The number of digits grows exponentially with the number of iterations. So it's computationally prohibitive to do that. So by the time you compute 1,000 iteration, you have more than number of items in the universe to represent that number. We know that it's between 0 and 1, but we don't know um, what the value is. So this is a, a typical example of chaotic system, um, where everything is deterministic. You know the initial condition. You know the rules de to derive from one step to the next. But I would say it's unpredictable because we don't know the value. It's just hidden. We don't know the value. In the long term, it's opaque. We don't know the future. Okay. So if you are curious about uh, what other R values, remember that R value, um, they can actually can take all R values as the horizontal axis, axis, and the uh, number, the pattern that settles on in the vertical axis. The first example R is 2.6, it settles on a single value. So here is the value it settles on. It settles on. So 3.4, remember the oxidation between two values? That is why, because you have two values to the pattern. And then remember the M shape is 3.5, that's four values. And 3.8, last example, the chaotic one, uh, you don't see a pattern actually, it's just seemingly randomly um, jumping in that range. Jumping in that range. Yeah. So this is called bifurcation diagram. Okay, let's look at another example. Let's play some game. Uh, this is called Game of Life. Another example. So the this whole Conway's Game of Life is played on a 2D grid, where each cell can be either dead or alive. Here, blue color means alive, and white color means dead. Um, it's a zero player game. Um, zero player means you just set up some initial conditions, you just bring some cells alive, and then the game will play itself by some rules, according to some rule. So the rules are like this. If a living cell, if a blue cell, has two or three uh, living neighbors, blue cell has two or three living uh, or blue cells, neighbors. So by the way, the neighbor is surrounding eight cells. It will stay alive. So in the first diagram, that cell at the center will stay alive. Uh, otherwise, it will die. But the second one, that will die because we only have one neighbor. Uh, if a dead cell, if an empty cell, a wet cell, uh, has three living, exactly three living neighbors, it will be alive, it will become alive. And otherwise, it will remain dead. So in the, in the last example, because it only has one neighbor, it will remain dead. So pretty simple, right? Um, let's play this game. Initially, so I set ball like this, just like here, square. And then according to the rules, 
if we come back this again, again, again. So if you look at this, this is very similar to the previous example, right? So what is function in this case? Function is just rules of the game. And uh, instead of using a number to represent state, this is the board. This is the entire 2D grid. So it's, you just iterate on the same rules. And then you play it again, again, again. Now something interesting happened. You see that goes back to the previous state. So if you take that but you take that grid and apply the rules, it goes back to the previous uh, grid. So like this. And it is kind of it's a cycle, kind of stuck there. So nothing interesting afterwards. It's just oxidating between the two states. All right. You have some interesting uh, equilibriums where it settles on some still lives. So it just remain there. Live cells stay there forever. Dead cells stay dead forever. Remain dead forever. And oscillators, similar to the one we just saw. So it's just alternating between two patterns. And space shapes, like moving across the ball. Coming back to the, uh, the chaos, chaotic behavior of this system, if I just bring one cell down, so it just kill one cell. So it's similar to the previous one. But just bring one down. It actually gives you a very different future. So just by remo removing one cell, you have a completely different path. This is, this is not, it's very different from what we, see, uh, what we saw just now. So this is a butterfly effect. Well, if you think about why we can predict weather, is because we know we have some sensors around the globe. We know that the variation of temperature of each point, we know the variation pressure I mean, of the atmosphere, we know the heating effects of the sun, and we think with the laws of physics, we should be able to predict the next day, right? But the thing is, Reality is we can't measure every single point on in the 3D state, 3D space. It's not possible. And with a single mismeasurement, or you didn't measure this part, and that could be this cell, and the weather you predict could be entirely different. And that makes long-range prediction of weather very difficult. Remember that uh, uh, 0, 0, 0 0.001 example. The first few days is fine, but if you project much longer than the actually very different, looks very different. So uh, the butterfly effect was coined by this uh, scientist called Edwin Lorenz. Uh, Lorenz was a, a pioneer in this field. So he once said, when the present determines the future, but the approximate present does not approximately determine the future. Uh, with that and my talk, uh, thank you. Yes, I can.